Hello, and welcome to Dystopian Review, the place where we dream about nightmare worlds. I'm your host, Jesse Pullman, and for our first episode, we're going to take a look at Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. So, Brave New World was the first dystopian novel that I ever read. Uh, it's by Aldous Huxley. It was published in 1932. Huxley himself was born in 1894, so that tells you how far back this goes. Uh, the novel itself is set in 2540. It's a full six centuries after Huxley lived. Uh, and it's set in a world with a one-world government. Uh, for those of you who are conspiracy fans, you probably noticed by now, one-world government's kind of a big thing. Uh, the most important features of this society are that there's a rigid caste system, they use subliminal messaging to control their citizens, uh, there's no more religion so much as there is a religion based around commercial entrepreneurs like Freud and Henry Ford, and my personal favorite, there's rampant sex and drugs, all used in combination to really try to control how the population of this world, uh, how they function really, how they live. When it comes to the caste system that the world state employs, we don't have to look any further than the first page of the novel to understand just how the government decides who will serve in what rank. From the very beginning, we are introduced to the Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Center, and I'll give you one guess what is hatched there. Huxley was from a family of teachers, writers, and biologists. For his novel, he devised a nearly unpronounceable method by which human embryos are collected. They are cloned, then doused with alcohol. What? The alcohol stunts the growth of these fetuses, but this is only one half of the hatching process. His family's background in education probably helped Huxley develop the second pillar of the world state's control over its people, the use of subliminal messaging to reinforce social order. In this passage, we can see how hypnotic suggestion is used to brainwash infants into accepting their lot in life. So, between controlling how fetuses develop and conditioning infants to their lot in life, Huxley's world government really creates a level of stability by the end of chapter 3, Huxley has laid out the demise of Christianity, a change that we can assume repeated itself throughout the world regardless of the precise faith in question. Interspersed into another conversation are splices of a bigwig scholar telling his listeners, the reader in essence, about how crosses were converted into T's in order to celebrate Henry Ford's Model T car. Whenever characters are stressed out or happy, instead of calling out to God, they cry Ford's name. Sometimes, if the denizens of the world state are talking about the psychology of a person, they'll refer to him as Freud instead. In essence, God has become transferable to whatever purpose people call upon him for. Predominantly, however, he's colored as the popular innovator of mass production because this culture is based around consumption. Once Huxley took care of birth and the afterlife, he only had to deal with that sliver of time called existence. And in this, his world controller government was genius. They decided that rather than have people toil and work, especially when you have an entire slave cast on hand, uh, the best option was to just let people party. It's hinted at in the clips that I presented earlier, but they came up with a little thing called Soma. Soma is a wonder drug that is liberally distributed to the world state's population. It's described as a hallucination-inducing narcotic without negative side effects when taken in reasonable doses, and addiction is never even touched upon. It should be mentioned that Huxley himself was something of a pioneer of drug experimentation, pushing the boundaries on psychedelic substances. Nevertheless, Soma is even weaponized to be used against rioters, as seen in this scene here. 
it's really indispensable to the world state's method of controlling people. As far as the sex goes, there's nothing explicit in the book. There's nothing like Fifty Shades of Grey. But it's used by the world controllers to foster social unity. And that's the point. It's all about getting society to work on the same page so that you don't have dissent. And that's how the world state operates. I wanted to give you an overview of what Brave New World is. Because that's really where the core of dystopian art lies. It's not always in the characters that inhabit a world. It's in how that world can feel real or how it cannot feel real. We're going to get into the characters in a minute. But before I do, I just want to touch on the source material a bit. This is one of the first works of dystopian literature that really hit the mainstream. There's an argument as to whether or not Huxley borrowed it from a book called We. George Orwell seemed to be of that belief, but Orwell and Huxley had a fundamental disagreement on where the world's, our world, was going to end up. Orwell thought it would be a lot darker and more painful, whereas Huxley saw a world where if you have a bad day at work, you go take drugs. Uh, if you want to have sex with that man or woman, you can. Nobody's going to care. There's no moral compunction about it. Uh, they don't invent new ways to do jobs. They don't invent efficiency improvement because all that would do is leave people with less time to work and more time to do drugs. So, in a way, Brave New World is a happy place that has gone kind of too far. It's close to like a permanent Disneyland, and that's not always a good thing either. Our protagonist is a man by the name of Bernard Marx, and yes, he's named after that Marx. Uh, he's an Alpha Plus, which means he's of the highest category, but something supposedly went wrong with his birth process. They say alcohol got tipped into his womb, for lack of a better term. And as a result, he's got a short stature, and he's not very visibly impressive. Uh, he's got a habit of being alone, which is kind of not a well-regarded thing in this society. The other characters in the book are Helmholtz Watson, who is a poet and is a friend of Bernard's, and he's very much an alpha. He gets, for lack of a better term, all the ladies. Uh, there's also Lenina Crown. She is sort of Bernard's love interest in that he actually does have some emotional uh, beliefs that we would understand, but she doesn't really reciprocate this. And finally, we have John the Savage. Now, he sort of takes over as our protagonist halfway through the book for reasons that I don't want to spoil. If you want to find out, and you should, then you need to pick the book up yourself. And that's Brave New World. I don't want to give you too much detail because, frankly, I don't want to spoil it for you. It's really worth the read. And it forms the first part of what I like to call the trinity of dystopian literature. Speaking of the trinity, I think we all know what's next. So until then, this is dystopian literature.